In this video, I'm going to start talking about the additive and multiplicative groups of integers modulo n. To begin, remember from the previous video that for each natural number n, we defined a relation on the set of integers by the rule that a equals b modulo n if and only if a minus b is divisible by n. The two important things that you need to remember about this from last time are that number one, equality modulo n is an equivalence relation on the integers. And number two, a complete set of distinct equivalence classes, which in this case are also called the residue classes modulo n, is the set consisting of the equivalence classes of the integers from zero up to n minus one. So in other words, every integer is in one of these equivalence classes, and every pair of equivalence classes in this list is distinct and therefore disjoint. Our notation for this collection of equivalence classes is z slash nz. We also refer to this as z mod nz for reasons which will become clear in later videos. Now, in not too long, we're going to drop the bar notation and simply write z mod nz as the set 0, 1, 2 out to n minus 1. But this is with the understanding that each one of the elements of this set represents an equivalence class of integers modulo n. For the beginning part of this video, though, we'll keep the bars on just to reinforce that understanding. Now, the first thing that we want to do here is to see if we can turn this collection of equivalence classes into a group. So in order to try to accomplish that, we're going to introduce two binary operations on the collection of equivalence classes z mod n z. The first binary operation is addition, and the rule for addition of equivalence classes is that for any integers a and b, the sum of the equivalence classes determined by a and b is defined to be the equivalence class determined by a plus b. Similarly, we define multiplication of equivalence classes by just multiplying their representatives. So if you have two integers a and b, then the product of the equivalence classes a bar and b bar is defined to be a b bar, which is the equivalence class with representative a b. Now there are a few basic questions that we need to address right away. And the very first one is, do these definitions even make sense? Usually we phrase that question by asking whether or not the binary operations that we've written down are well defined. And what we really mean in this context is do the definitions somehow depend in a hidden way on the choices of the representatives for the equivalence classes modulo n. So for example, if we choose two different representatives a1 and a2 for the same equivalence class and two different representatives b1 and b2 for the same equivalence class, when we follow the recipe, to add the equivalence classes of a1 and b1, will we get the same thing as when we follow the recipe to add the equivalence classes of a2 and b2? Similarly for multiplication, if we choose different representatives for the same equivalence classes, is that somehow going to affect the result that we get when we try to multiply together those two equivalence classes? If so, it would mean that our binary operations are not well defined, and that's something that we want to try to avoid. So we're going to want to check right away that the definitions that we've given of addition and multiplication of residue classes don't depend on the choices of the representatives for those residue classes. Once that's accomplished, the second question that we want to explore is what additional properties do these binary operations have? So in particular, are the integers modulo n together with the binary operation a group? And how about the integers modulo n together with multiplication? Well, you can think about this before we get to it and decide what you think the answers to these questions are. Let's start with addition modulo n, and let's go ahead and prove that it's well-defined. So suppose that we have integers a1 and a2 that are both representatives for the same equivalence class modulo n, and integers b1 and b2 which are both representatives for the same equivalence class modulo n. Using the definition of what it means for a1 and b1 to equal a2 and b2 modulo n, we have that a1 minus a2 and b1 minus b2 are both divisible by n. In other words, there exist integers k and l with the properties that a1 minus a2 is nk and b1 minus b2 is nl. Well, that means that a1 plus b1 is equal to a2 plus nk plus b2 plus nl. And grouping together the two pieces that have the factor of n, that's equal to a2 plus b2 plus an integer multiple of n. That implies that a1 plus b1 minus a2 plus b2 is divisible by n. And that's the same as saying that a1 plus b1 is equal to a2 plus b2 modulo n, which means that a1 plus b1 and a2 plus b2 are representatives for the same equivalence class modulo n. 
That verifies our claim that addition modulo n is a well-defined binary operation which doesn't depend on the choices of representatives for the equivalence classes involved. Next, let's try to determine what other properties this binary operation has. First of all, let's decide whether or not it's associative. If I take three residue classes, a bar, b bar, and c bar, and I add them together, adding a and b bar first, I'm going to get a plus b bar plus c bar, which by definition is the same as a plus b plus c bar. But because the addition of integers is associative, I can move the parentheses over and write that as a plus b plus c bar, and then I can unravel the steps on the other side to conclude that that's equal to a bar plus b plus c bar. That shows that addition on the collection of residue classes modulo n is an associative binary operation, and it followed very easily from the definition of addition of residue classes together with the associativity of addition of integers. Now, we'd like to know whether or not this set together with this binary operation forms a group. So next, let's check for the presence of an identity element. A natural element to look to in this context is the residue class of zero. And indeed, if you pick any residue class a bar and you add it to the residue class of zero, by definition, you just get a plus zero bar, which is a bar. And the same thing happens if you work from the other direction, zero bar plus a bar is also equal to a bar. Therefore, the residue class of zero plays the role of an identity element in this setting. Finally, let's check for the existence of inverses. If we take any residue class a bar, and we add it to the residue class with representative negative a, then by definition of addition of residue classes, this is just the residue class with representative a plus negative a, but of course that's just the residue class of zero. So this shows that the inverse of a bar for this binary operation is negative a bar. Of course, there are also other choices of representatives for that inverse. So for example, it's also the same as n minus a bar, since those two representatives are equal to each other modulo n. But in any case, the point here is that every residue class has an additive inverse. And since we've checked all three properties, we can now conclude that z mod nz together with addition is a group. A couple of other important things to point out about this group are that, number one, it's an abelian group. And that follows immediately from the definition of addition of residue classes, together with the fact that addition of integers is commutative. And number two, this group is also a cyclic group. We actually mentioned this before in our video about groups of orders one through three, but I'll just mention it again here. If you consider the subset of this group generated by the residue class one, remembering that we're working with additive notation here, you just end up with zero times one, one times one, two times one, all the way up to n minus one times one. But by the definition of addition of residue classes, that gives you all of the elements of z mod nz. So it shows that one is a generator for this group. We've also mentioned before that up to isomorphism, there's only one cyclic group of order n. So that also implies that z mod nz is isomorphic to this cyclic group of order n. Finally, before we move on, it's also worth it to define subtraction modulo n in the obvious way. If we have two equivalence classes with representatives a and b, we define a bar minus b bar to be a bar plus the additive inverse of b bar which is the same as a bar plus the equivalence class represented by negative b, which by definition is the equivalence class represented by a plus negative b, which is the equivalence class represented by a minus b. So long story short, a bar minus b bar is defined to be the equivalence class with representative a minus b. And of course, this equivalence class is well defined and doesn't depend on the choice of representatives for a bar and b bar. Next, let's talk about multiplication modulo n. And just as before, first of all, we'd like to prove that this binary operation really is well-defined so that it doesn't depend on the choices of representatives for the equivalence classes involved. In order to do that, as before, let's suppose that a1, a2, b1, and b2 are integers, and that a1 bar is equal to a2 bar and b1 bar is equal to b2 bar. Well, just as before, that means that a1 minus a2 is nk, and b1 minus b2 is nl for some integers k and l. And now when I multiply together a1 and b1, I can rewrite the product as a2 plus nk times b2 plus nl. Expanding this out and then collecting together all of the terms which have a factor of n, we find that a1 b1 is equal to a2 b2 plus an integer multiple of n. That implies that n divides the difference of a1 b1 minus a2 b2 
so that A1B1 and A2B2 define the same residue class as modulo n. This verifies that multiplication as we've defined it is a well-defined binary operation on residue classes modulo n. Well, now that we know that both addition and multiplication are well-defined on residue classes modulo n, let's relax our notation a little, and from now on, instead of writing a bars, let's just write a's for the residue classes of integers modulo n. Keep in mind though that this is always with the understanding that when we're working modulo n, integers actually represent equivalence classes. So each integer modulo n represents a whole set of integers which are equal to that integer modulo n. Next, let's try to decide whether or not the integers modulo n together with multiplication form a group. Well, first of all, just as before, because multiplication of residue classes modulo n is defined by multiplying their representatives, which are integers, and because multiplication of integers is associative, we immediately get that multiplication of residue classes modulo n as we've defined it is an associative operation. Also, it's not too difficult to see that the residue class of 1 behaves as a multiplicative identity, because if I multiply any other residue class by 1, either from the left or from the right, I'm just going to get that residue class back. Therefore, the residue class of 1 is an identity element for this binary operation on the set. Now let's think about whether or not every element of this set has a multiplicative inverse. You have to be a little bit careful here, because sometimes it's pretty close. But if you think about it, the residue class of 0 is always going to have the property that when you multiply it by any other residue class, you get 0. Now, in order for 0 to have a multiplicative inverse, there would have to be a residue class out there with the property that when I multiply 0 by that residue class, I get the identity element. But now 0 is not equal to 1, modulo n, unless, of course, n is equal to 1. As long as n is greater than or equal to 2, though, this calculation shows that the residue class of 0 will not have a multiplicative inverse. And so, since not every element of this set has a multiplicative inverse, it's not a group if n is bigger than or equal to 2. Now, that's not really the end of the story because, just like when we were working with the rationals or the reals with respect to multiplication, we can try to fix this problem by throwing out all of the residue classes which do not have multiplicative inverses modulo n. That leaves us with what are called the primitive residue classes modulo n, which are the residue classes A with the property that there exists a B, such that A times B is equal to 1 mod n. There are a couple of notations for this. I'm going to write Z mod n Z with a time symbol, but some people also use a star symbol here. And now I want to try to convince you that the collection of primitive residue classes modulo n together with multiplication does actually define a group. However, before I do that, there are a couple things that I need to clear up here. And the first is, how do I know that when I take two elements of the set and multiply them together, I will stay in the set? In other words, how do I know that the restriction of multiplication of residue classes to this smaller set is actually a well-defined binary operation? Well, in order to see that, let's suppose that I have residue classes A1 and A2 in the set. Then, by definition, there have to be integers B1 and B2 with the properties that A1, B1, and A2, B2 are both equal to 1 modulo n. Well then, if I take a1, a2 times b1, b2, since multiplication of integers is commutative, I can write that as a1, b1 times a2, b2, which is 1 times 1, or 1, modulo n. And that guarantees that the equivalence class of a1, a2 is an element of the collection of primitive residue classes modulo n. That means that there's no problem in restricting multiplication to the set, so that it does define a well-defined binary operation on the collection of primitive residue classes modulo n. Next, let's show that the collection of primitive residue classes together with multiplication is a group. And while we're doing this, we'll just go ahead and show that it's an abelian group. First of all, because multiplication on the collection of all residue classes modulo n is associative, the restriction of multiplication to the collection of primitive residue classes is also associative. And secondly, because multiplication of residue classes is defined using multiplication of the integers which represent the classes, and because multiplication of integers is commutative, it implies right away that multiplication of residue classes in this set is a commutative operation. Commutativity, remember, is the additional property that we need in order to establish that this is an abelian group. Now once again, just as before, the element 1 has the property that 1 times 1 equals 1 mod n, so it's definitely a primitive residue class modulo n, and it plays the role of the identity element in this group. And finally, to make sure that every primitive residue class has a multiplicative inverse, if we have a primitive residue class A, 
then by definition there exists a residue class B with the property that A times B is 1 modulo N. Well this definition is symmetric in the sense that A does for B what B does for A, and so it also qualifies B to be an element of this set. Since for every element of this set there's another element of the set with the property that when you multiply them together you get the identity element. That establishes the existence of inverses, and it shows that the collection of primitive residue classes together with multiplication is an abelian group. At this point I'm going to mention a couple more notational conventions. So first of all, as usual, when we write z mod nz, we could be thinking of this just as the collection of all residue classes modulo n. But if we're thinking of it as a set together with a group structure, then it should be clear that that group structure has to be addition. So when we write z mod nz as a group, we mean the additive group of integers modulo n. Now similarly, when we write z mod nz times, it's implicit that the group structure here is multiplication. So even though we could just be thinking of the collection of primitive residue classes modulo n, if we're writing this object and thinking of it as a group, then it has to be the multiplicative group of integers modulo n. So from now on, when we write these groups, usually we're not going to indicate the binary operation, because that should be implicit from what we've talked about up to this point. Now, I like to emphasize doing examples with numbers. I think that's one of the fun things about math, and it's a test to see whether or not you really understand what you're doing. So let's consider the case when n is equal to 8. We already know what the additive group of integers modulo 8 looks like. It's just a cyclic group of order 8, and it's generated by the residue class 1. So we won't spend a lot of time on that one. But what does the multiplicative group of primitive residue classes modulo 8 look like? Well, let's do a little scratch work here. We already know that the residue class 1 is going to be in the multiplicative group, so let's try to figure out whether the residue class 2 is going to be in the multiplicative group. Remember that the requirement for 2 to be in the multiplicative group is that there would have to be an integer b with the property that 2 times b equals 1 mod 8. Well, writing down what that means, it would mean that 2b minus 1 is an integer multiple of 8, but then rearranging that equation, we would have that 1 is equal to 8k minus 2b, and the right hand side here is an integer multiple of 2. That would imply that 2 divides 1, which is not true, and so we conclude that the residue class 2 is not an element of z mod 8z times. Now by almost the same argument, we can see that 0, 4, and 6 are also not elements of z mod 8z times. And so we're left with the residue classes 1, 3, 5, and 7. Well, each of the residue classes 1, 3, 5, and 7 has the property that there's another residue class such that when you multiply them together you get 1 mod 8. So 1 squared is 1, 3 squared is 9, which is 1 mod 8, 5 squared is 25, and 7 squared is 49. All of them are 1 mod 8. And that means that 1, 3, 5, and 7 are all elements of this group. So z mod 8 z star is a group of order 4, consisting of these residue classes modulo 8 with the binary operation of multiplication. Now, of course we shouldn't stop there, because just knowing that the order of this group is 4 doesn't tell us what group it is. We know from our video about groups of orders 4 through 8 that up to isomorphism there are actually two different groups of order 4. So the question is, which group is this one isomorphic to? Well, the calculation that we just did showed that all of these elements square to 1 mod 8, and that means that none of the residue classes in this group are generators for the group. So it can't be a cyclic group, and that leaves us with the only other possibility that z mod 8 z star is isomorphic to the Klein 4 group. Now let's consider what happens when n is 9. Once again, z mod nz is just a cyclic group of order 9 generated by the residue class 1, so the real question here is what's the group structure of z mod nz times? Well, let's do some scratch work again. Suppose I choose a residue class A, which has a non-trivial common factor with the modulus 9. So let's write d for the GCD of A and 9, and let's suppose that d is bigger than 1. If for such a residue class A there were an integer b with the property that a times b is 1 mod 9, then it would mean that ab minus 1 is 9 times k for some integer k. Rearranging this equation would give 1 equals ab plus 9k, and then factoring out the GCD d, this would be equal to d times a over d times b plus 9 over d times k. But the thing to notice here is that because d is a common divisor of both a and 9, both of the quantities inside the parentheses here, a over d and 9 over d, are actually integers. So the right hand side here is an integer multiple of d. That implies that d divides 1, but since d was actually greater than 1, 
That's a contradiction. Therefore, we conclude that such a residue class A, which has a non-trivial common divisor with 9, cannot be an element of the set z mod n z times. And that tells us that the residue classes 0, 3, and 6 are not elements of this set. Now, on the other hand, for the remaining residue classes 1, 2, 4, 5, 7, and 8, we can check directly that in every one of these cases, there's an integer with the property that when you multiply them together, you get 1 mod n. And that qualifies the remaining 6 residue classes to be elements of z mod n z times. Therefore, in this case, the multiplicative group z mod n z times is the group consisting of the residue classes 1, 2, 4, 5, 7, and 8 modulo 9, together with the binary operation of multiplication. Well now, once again, we're not done, because even though we know that the order of this group is 6, we also know that there are two groups of order 6 up to isomorphism. There's the cyclic group of order 6 and the dihedral group of order 6. So the question is, which of these two groups is this one isomorphic to? Well, there's an obvious giveaway in this case, which is the fact that the multiplicative group of z mod n z times is an abelian group. And since d6 is a non-abelian group, that forces z mod n z times to be isomorphic to the cyclic group of order 6. Now, I guess I didn't prove this yet, but if two groups are isomorphic, then they both either have to be abelian or non-abelian. Even though we haven't talked a lot about isomorphism yet, that fact does follow pretty easily from the definition that we gave for what it means for two groups to be isomorphic. Okay, well, let's try to do one more step here. Since we know that this is a cyclic group, let's try to find a generator for the group. Now, of course, the identity element is not going to be a generator for the group, because the identity element to any power is just the identity element. So we can move on to the residue class 2. And now, since this is a multiplicative group, we compute 2 to the 1, 2 squared, 2 cubed, 2 to the 4th, 2 to the 5th, and 2 to the 6th, all working modulo 9. And we notice right away that all of the answers are different residue classes modulo 9. Therefore, the powers of 2 trace out all of the elements of this group, which means that it's generated by the single element 2. I want to reinforce here that when you're moving back and forth between additive and multiplicative groups, you have to be careful to pay attention to whether or not you're supposed to add or multiply elements. I also want to point out in this example, just because I like to try to emphasize computational efficiency when possible, that a slightly faster way to compute these powers of 2 in this example could have been to notice that 8 is negative 1 modulo 9. So when you double it, you get negative 2. And when you double that, you get negative 4. And when you double that, you get negative 8 modulo 9. Anyway, this is only a slow speed up in this problem, but I just want to show it to you to show you that there are other ways of doing these computations. Next, I want to talk a little bit more about the basic structure and properties of z mod n z times. And to avoid some trivialities, let's just assume in this discussion that n is bigger than or equal to 2. Now, the first thing that I want to convince you of, which is something that you may have discerned or conjectured in the examples from before, is that the collection of primitive residue classes modulo n turns out to be precisely the collection of residue classes from 1 to n minus 1, which are relatively prime to n. Now, remember, this is not the original definition that we gave of z mod n z times. We define z mod n z times to be the collection of residue classes with the property that there exists a b such that a times b is 1 mod n. But what I'm telling you here is that that set is actually equal to this set. Now, if you were paying attention in the previous examples, you might already have some idea how to prove this. First of all, let's choose a residue class a from 0 to n minus 1. And let's write d for the GCD of a and n. Suppose that d is greater than 1. In this case, we want to prove that the residue class A is not in the set z mod n z times. So arguing by way of contradiction, let's suppose that there were an integer b with the property that a times b is equal to 1 mod n. In that case, we would have that n divides a b minus 1, which means that a b minus 1 is n times k for some integer k. Now rearranging this equation would give that 1 is a b minus n k, and factoring out a d on the right hand side would leave us with d times an integer. Once again, as in the previous example, it's important here to notice that d is a common divisor of a and n, so that the quantity in the parentheses here really is an integer. Now that leads us to the conclusion that d divides 1, but since d is actually greater than 1, that's a contradiction. So we conclude that the residue class a is not an element of z mod n z times. That's one half of the proof. Now, if you like the video about properties of integers, then I think you're also going to like the second half of the proof. So for the second half of the proof, let's assume that A is a residue class with the property that the GCD of A and N is equal to 1. 
Then, by Bazu's lemma, from our video about properties of integers, there exist integers b and k such that ab plus nk is equal to the gcd, which is 1. But now you should think about the left and right hand sides of this equation modulo n. Since n divides ab minus 1, when I read this equation modulo n, it just says ab equals 1 mod n. And of course the existence of such a b is exactly what we wanted to show in order to establish that a is an element of the set of primitive residue classes modulo n. Therefore that completes the proof of this alternate characterization of the collection of primitive residue classes modulo n. Now before we leave this slide there's another thing that I'd like to point out here. And that is that from our video on properties of integers we also learned a fast algorithm for finding integers b and k with the property that ab plus nk is equal to the GCD of a and n. Now in the setting here that we're working in, this integer b turned out to be the inverse of a modulo n. So if you think about it, that means that we can turn our fast algorithm into a fast algorithm for computing the inverse of an integer modulo n whenever the integer is relatively prime to n. Now I think we should do an example with numbers. So let's give an example of how to compute the inverse of an integer modulo n using our fast algorithm, which is the reverse Euclidean algorithm. For this example, let's take the modulus n to be 101, which is a prime number, and let's take the residue class 45 modulo 101. Now these are relatively small numbers. So of course, if you just get out a calculator and start computing, you're probably gonna be able to figure out what the inverse of a modulo n is pretty quickly. But let's try to do this using the reverse Euclidean algorithm. That way we can have a model for how to do this when the integers get bigger. So first of all, I run the regular Euclidean algorithm, and I write 101 as a quotient times 45 plus a remainder, which is bigger than or equal to 0 and less than 45. Then I shift the rolls of these numbers over, and I write 45 as a quotient times 11 plus a remainder, which is less than or equal to 10 and bigger than or equal to 0. And then I shift the numbers over again, and I see that 11 is actually an integer multiple of 1, which confirms that the GCD of 101 and 45 is actually 1. If you believe me that 101 is prime, then that should have already been obvious to you. Well, now that I've reached the bottom of the Euclidean algorithm, I back up one step to the next to last step, and I run the reverse Euclidean algorithm. So first of all, I write the GCD as an integer linear combination of 45 and 11. And then I solve for 11 on the previous step of the Euclidean algorithm, and I substitute it in, then expand out and collect like terms to get 1 as an integer linear combination of 45 and 101. Now, if there were more steps, I would just keep going. And you can see the video on properties of integers to remember how that works. But the point is that now I've written 1 as an integer multiple of 45 plus an integer multiple of 101. So if I think about this equation modulo the modulus, I see that 1 is equal to 9 times 45 modulo 101. That's just another way of saying that the multiplicative inverse of 45 modulo 101 is 9. So this is a prototypical example of how you do this kind of computation. The next thing that I'd like to talk about is a very common problem, which is to decide when there are integer solutions x to an equation of the form ax equals b modulo n, where a and b are integers. Now of course, to solve this equation, you'd like to try to divide both sides by a, but the problem is that we're working modulo n, and a may not have an inverse modulo n. Actually, the full answer to this question is even a little bit more complicated than that, so we're going to divide our analysis into a couple of cases. First of all, the easy case is when the GCD of a and n is equal to 1, because in this case I know that a is invertible modulo n, and I can take x to be any integer which represents the equivalence class a inverse b modulo n. When I substitute such an integer x into this equation, working modulo n, I end up with a times a inverse b, and using associativity, together with the fact that a inverse is a multiplicative inverse of a modulo n, I find that ax is equal to b modulo n. Furthermore, it's not difficult to see that in this case, any integer x which is a solution to this equation is going to have to be equal to a inverse b modulo n. That's essentially by the cancellation law in the group z mod n z times, and it guarantees that the solution x to this equation in this case is unique modulo n. Therefore, the set of all solutions x to this equation in this case is just the single residue class a inverse b modulo n. Now let's think about what happens when the GCD of a and n is greater than 1. Let's write d for this GCD, and let's start with the observation 
that there's going to be an integer x with the property that ax equals b modulo n, if and only if we can write ax as b plus an integer multiple of n. So if and only if there exist integers x and k such that ax is b plus nk. Well, rearranging this equation, this is going to happen if and only if there exist integers x and k such that ax minus nk is equal to b. And how do I know whether or not there are such integers x and k? Well, the answer is that there will be integers x and k like this if and only if the integer b is divisible by the GCD. And that's precisely the statement of Bezu's lemma, the set of all numbers of the form ax minus nk, where x and k run through the integers, is the same as the set of all multiples of the GCD. So our original equation ax equals b mod n will have a solution if and only if the GCD of a and n divides the integer b. Now it turns out that when there is a solution to this equation, we can also classify the set of all solutions. That's an important step in some problems, so let's go ahead and look at the details. So let's suppose that the GCD of a and n divides b, so that there is a solution to the equation ax equals b. And using our notation from before, let's take the equation that we had, which was ax minus nk equals b, and divide both sides by d. We then have that for any solution x to this equation, there must exist an integer k with the property that a over d times x minus n over d times k is equal to b over d. Now just as before, a over d and n over d are both integers. And since d is the greatest common divisor of a and n, when I divide a and n by d, the resulting quotients are going to have no more common prime factors, so they're going to be relatively prime to each other. Well, if you think about it, that means that the residue class a over d it's going to be invertible modulo the modulus n over d. So what I want to do now is think about this equation modulo n over d. And notice that any solution x to this equation modulo n over d must satisfy x equals a over d inverse times b over d modulo n over d. Just be careful here because the inverse here is an inverse modulo n over d. And it's important to make that distinction since we have two different moduli on the page here. So this tells us that when there is a solution x to our equation ax equals b, then every such solution must satisfy this equation modulo n over d. Now because the previous discussion is important, I'd like to sum up the results that we obtained there in a theorem, and then I'll do a computational example. So our question was whether or not the equation ax equals b modulo n has integer solutions x, and also when it does have solutions, what does the set of all solutions look like? Well, the answer was that this equation will have integer solutions x if and only if d, the GCD of a and n, also divides b. In addition, when this condition does hold, then the set of all solutions is a single residue class modulo n over d. It's the set of all integers which are congruent modulo n over d to a over d inverse modulo n over d times b over d. In other words, if you pick a single integer which is equal to this residue class modulo n over d, then the set of all possible solutions to this equation is going to be that integer plus the set of all possible integer multiples of n over d. Now, as always, I think it's very helpful to do an example with numbers. So for our example, let's try to determine the set of all integer solutions x to the equation 115x is equal to 69 modulo 667. Now, as in some of our previous examples, these are pretty small numbers, so you could brute force this. But let's try to do it in a way that's going to be fast, even when we're working with larger numbers. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to compute the GCD of 115 and 667 and see whether or not that divides 69, because that's going to tell us whether or not there even are any solutions x to this equation. So to compute the GCD of 115 and 667, let's use the Euclidean algorithm. First of all, we write 667 as a quotient times 115 plus a remainder. And then we shift the roles of the numbers over, and we write 115 as a quotient times 92 plus a remainder. And then we shift the roles of the numbers again, but this time we find that 92 is actually an integer multiple of 23. And so we're done, and we can conclude that the GCD of these two numbers is actually 23. Now, since 23 divides 69, we know from the theorem on the previous slide that this equation does have a solution. To figure out what the set of all solutions is, First, we want to determine a particular solution to the equation, which means that we need to take all of these numbers and divide them by d, and then compute the inverse of a over d modulo n over d, and multiply that by b over d. 
That's going to give us a particular solution to this equation. And once we have that, we can easily write down the set of all solutions. Now at this point, I'll mention that it's easy to compute the inverse of 5 modulo 29. Hopefully you can just see what the answer is, but pretend like you didn't know that. And now I want to mention that there's a little bit of a shortcut. Instead of trying to run the Euclidean algorithm again with the integers 29 and 5, you can take all the steps in the Euclidean algorithm that you use to compute the GCD of a and n, and just divide both sides of all of these equations by the GCD. That's going to give you exactly the numbers that you need in order to compute the inverse of 5 modulo 29 using the reverse Euclidean algorithm. So to see that in action, we'll pretend that we don't already know what the inverse of 5 modulo 29 is. We'll take the steps from our Euclidean algorithm calculation, and we'll divide both sides of each of these equations by 23 leaving the quotients alone. That's going to give us exactly the steps that we would have needed to compute the GCD of 29 and 5 using the Euclidean algorithm. Then if we just take these steps and we run them through the reverse Euclidean algorithm, we find very quickly that 1 is equal to 6 times 5 minus 1 times 29. Now reading the left and right hand sides of this equation modulo 29 gives 6 times 5 equals 1 mod 29, which means that the inverse of 5 modulo 29 is 6. Well, now we can compute a particular solution to our equation ax equals b. And that particular solution is going to be the inverse of 5 modulo 29 times 3. And a representative for this equivalence class is 18 modulo 29. Now, since this integer is determined uniquely modulo 29, we know that the set of all solutions is the set of all numbers of the form 18 plus k times 29, where k is an integer. That finishes this example. And it's a pretty prototypical example for how to solve equations of this form. Okay, well, that's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. In the next video, we're going to continue talking about integers modulo n, and we're going to explore a few more advanced facts.